Good evening, everybody. I'm Jerry Kalankowitz. I'm here to welcome you to this, our May 2022 meeting of the Historical Society of Frankfurt. Uh, tonight's topic is the restoration of the William Cowden Civil uh, And I'll talk a little bit more about that shortly. Uh, I want to give you a preview of next month's meeting, uh, which is about this book that's just been written, The Borough of Frankfurt by John C. Uh, C. Manton, uh, and copies of the book. Uh, oh, Lord. Okay, uh, so what we do here's John uh, talk a little bit more about the meeting. William Cowden was a youth. 1863. So, young, his father was also a cat, and young William listed as a, as a child soldier. This is this is kind of frowned upon by most tribes these days, but uh, it was common practice at the time. And he was at the seminal event. Of the Seminole War of American history, in which 600,000 Americans died. 600,000, more than any other two wars we ever fought. The Seminole War of our history. And this drum, which, which you'll see shortly, is a major figure, I think. American history as accompanied by this youth who, uh, who drummed it at the time. And uh, so we're very happy to have it. The family gave it to us uh, generations later. And uh, we found that it had fallen into disrepair during the uh, administration of our current board. And so we, we found Laura Kaplan to uh, do some restoration work on it. And she's going to talk first tonight about the work that she did and what restoration is all about in her field. She's at Winter Tour as, a, as an archi archivist? Object conservator. Object conservator. And uh, does uh, this work as well uh, for a private. I guess private uh, contracts, and we're very pleased with the work she's done, and we uh, are looking forward to hearing her description of how she went about it. Thanks so much, John, for that introduction. Uh, hi, I'm Laura, and I'm a conservator of three-dimensional objects, like John said. I work at Winter Tour Museum, and I also teach in their art conservation graduate program, which is co-sponsored by the University of Delaware. Before that, I ran my own objects conservation business in Baltimore, working with clients from DC to Philadelphia and beyond. Now that we've heard a little bit about the history of William Cowden and his remarkable drum, I'll take you through the process of its treatment. But before that, I'd like to say a few words about what 
observation is. And if we could have the next slide. Conservators are responsible for the long-term preservation of our collective material cultural heritage, from family heirlooms to world treasures and everything in between. We're sometimes referred to as art doctors. And while it isn't a perfect analogy, there are a lot of parallels you can draw. To start with, conservators take care of an object's physical needs through hands-on treatment, like a doctor or a surgeon. And here you can see a conservator using dilute adhesive applied with a medical syringe, no less, to stabilize a painted wooden drawer by contemporary artist Purvis Young. As with medicine, our treatments are guided by a rigorous code of ethics to ensure everything we do is safe and effective. It's not exactly the Hippocratic Oath, but it's along those lines. We also document our treatments with written reports and images so that anyone in the future can know exactly what we did and why. We keep files on them, a lot like medical records. Next slide, please. But there's more to conservation than treatment. Just like in medicine, we're big proponents of preventive care, and we advise on proper handling, storage, transport, and display measures that will help preserve the long-term stability of art and artifacts. In this image, a conservator is showing different storage enclosures that are commonly used for books and works of art on paper to protect them and keep them safe and stable over time. We also do a great deal of technical research on the materials and techniques used to make artwork and artifacts not only to add to the historical record, but also to understand how these materials deteriorate and how we can best take care of them, even testing out new treatment techniques, which is a bit like running clinical trials in medicine. Now, some of this we can do on our own as conservators, but we also work closely with conservation scientists and other experts to help achieve our research goals. We're a very collaborative field. And finally, we're heavily involved in advocacy, education, and community outreach initiatives that promote cultural health through heritage preservation. Next slide. As you can imagine, becoming a conservator and doing all of these things requires specialized education and training, which we get through graduate study, our version of medical school. But we're a small field, and there are only five programs in North America that offer advanced degrees in art conservation, each taking around six to 10 students a year. And they're hard to get into with more applicants than spots. To get into a program, candidates need to have undergraduate coursework in fine arts, art history, or other cultural studies, chemistry, and also have done a certain number of hours of actual hands-on experience with conservation and collections care. It's such a specific skill set and requires a very particular kind of temperament. So we want to make sure that people are sure that conservation is the right career for them before they invest in going to graduate school. So they have to do all of these things, and that's all before even entering the program. Once there, though, students further build their skills and knowledge through coursework and internships. And here you can see students learning different techniques for cleaning baskets in one of the courses that I teach. After graduating, students usually complete one or more postgraduate fellowships, almost like medical residencies, before entering the workforce, whether that's in an institution like a museum or archive, a research lab, of which there are a few in the country, or in private practice, which is actually where I end up. Next slide, please. One last thing to mention is that because there's so much to know about any one type of material, conservators will specialize in a particular area. Again, three most areas are paintings, works on paper, and objects, though there are many others, as you can see in this list. Objects is the broadest specialty. It includes inorganic materials like glass, ceramics, metals, and stone and organic materials like leather, parchment, ivory, tortoiseshell, horn, basketry, and even plastics. I like to joke that people are drawn to objects because they're either interested in everything or are just really indecisive, or maybe a little bit of both. For me, the variety was very appealing. I'm never bored, and in this image you can see me happily surrounded by many different kinds of objects.
specific areas for us. For me, it's been organic materials, skin and leather in particular. And that's why when the historical society ready to do the work, they cannot know what to do for the parchment drum heads. And I'd like to find a conservator to work with. Do visit the website of our national professional organization, the American Institute of Conservation. Here's what it looked like before treatment. As you can see, it's missing several key components. Okay, the missing parts so that the drum would appear whole again and so could better tell its remarkable story. But to do this, there were a lot of questions we needed to answer first. What parts exactly were missing? What were they made of? What would they look, have looked like originally? What should they look like now? And do we need to replicate all of them to achieve our goal? I started where we always start in conservation, with background research about the object. And that meant I needed to brush up on Civil War era drums in general, which was not a topic I knew a whole lot about. Academic sources were somewhat scant. examples of surviving Civil War drums, including some right here in the Society's collection, along with graphs and, of course, from the this is the type of drum known as a which was in very common use at the time. There's also a very open side, which you can just barely see, and if you click again to the least tell the drum. And the next slide. <coughs> and here's a detailed shot that shows it better. The label is damaged. A Boston-based company repaired the did their business at the Tremont Street location noted on the label from 1883 to 63, which narrows down the date. Next slide. This White Brothers drum on an auction website. This is another exciting find. So this drum is in a more complete state. And so it's a better sense of what the would have looked like with most of its And here's another 1860s White Brothers drum, this time from the Museum of American History. It has good provenance information with no civil war, used by a William Choate of Massachusetts. So white next slide. The next step was to take a deeper dive into the anatomy of a rope tension drum to get a better handle on what parts were missing. Let's let, walk through this together with the help of this handy diagram from one of those helpful drum making companies that I mentioned before. Next slide. The main body of the drum is called the shell. It's made of wood and has a vent hole to allow air to escape. Fortunately, the shell of the cabin drum is intact and was in pretty good shape. It didn't need anything beyond just basic surface cleaning. Next slide. Oh, next. The drum heads fit over either end of the shell. These would have been made of parchment stretched over wooden hoops, similar to embroidery hoops. We still have the hoops and the society uh,
So getting back to our drum anatomy, uh, if you could go a little more. Okay. Everything is held together by two hefty wooden rings called counter rings that rest on top of the drum heads. Rope, which at this time would have been made out of hemp, passes through holes in the counter hoops, and the tension can be adjusted with leather tighteners, variously known as lugs, tugs, or my favorite, ears. We still had both counter hoops, and they were in good condition, but the rope and ears were long gone, not at all unusual, as these don't tend to hold up over time and are often discarded, and we definitely wanted to replace them. Oh, keep going. Two more. There's the rope, sorry. And the, ear, the ears. And um, next slide. Yes, thank you. Another question we had about the counter hoops was if they once had metal rope hooks, like those on this simple drum from the Bennington Museum in Vermont, or if the rope just went directly through the holes in the wooden counter hoops. It's actually pretty easy to tell because each leaves distinctive impressions in the wood, and the Calvin drum clearly shows impressions of just rope. It's hard to see in this image, and if you could click to the next. But um, they're at a diagonal and off to the end of the rope hole. And I've circled it here, hopefully you can see, it might be a little dark. Now, plus there weren't any rope hooks in the other White Brothers examples. And while we're looking at the Vermont drum, um, I can't resist sharing the story I found in its catalog record. It reads, this military snare drum belonged to Norman F. Puffer, who enlisted as a drummer in the second Vermont Volunteers in the spring of 1861, just after his 14th birthday, so another young person, re-enlisting later in the 10th Vermont, who served throughout the Civil War. He valued his drum very highly and sent it home at the beginning of the Wilderness Campaign with a comrade who had secured a furlough. The man, however, yielded to temptation to celebrate in Washington. When he recovered, he had lost the drum and was unable to find it. In 1898, however, in a North Adams, Massachusetts newspaper, there was a description of the drum, then in the possession of the Williamstown Band, bearing the name N. M. Puffer. This news item gave Mr. Puffer the first information of his drum since he had parted with it in Virginia 35 years before. He obtained the drum from the leader of the Williamstown Band, and it remained one of his prized possessions until his death in 1912. Another reminder of just how powerful these objects can be. Next slide. And one more. There, oh, go back. There we go. The last element to look at are snares made of gut that stretch across the bottom drum head and are attached with metal hardware. All we have left of these are fragments, and if you can go to the next slide, which are visible in this detailed shot. And the next slide. We can see what they would have looked like on the White Brothers drum from the auction site. And you can see them they've been stretched across the top of the image of the drum on the right. But we decided not to replicate them, since they're mostly hidden when the drum is upright, which is how it's most likely to be displayed. It would have been a different story if we wanted to return the drum to a playable condition. And for some musical instruments, this is an important part of their preservation. Knowing what they sound like and what it's like to play them is crucial to understanding them and preserving the, the history of them. But it wasn't felt to be necessary for the Calvin drum in its current role. And besides, it would have taken the project into a more intensive type of restoration that would have been outside of my scope as an objects discoverer. Next slide, please. So having established these parameters, I was ready to start the treatment. I began with surface cleaning using a brush and vacuum with micro tool attachments, followed by gentle wiping with dry soft sponges, which is what you see in this bag here. Conservators are funny, we hold on to our used cleaning materials in case they might be useful for further analysis or for some other reason, or so we tell ourselves. Honestly, I think we do it because it's so satisfying to see just how much dirt has come off, especially when the object itself doesn't look much different, which was the case with the drum, and that's why I'm not showing you a picture of it before and after cleaning. It wouldn't show up in the photos. But rest assured that we do throw everything away when we're done with the treatment. Next slide. I then turned my attention to making the replica materials in close consultation with the society. 
For the drum heads, I didn't want to use parchment since it's such a reactive material. And after some testing, I settled on a special kind of Japanese paper made of mulberry fibers, which is very strong and stable and can be toned with acrylic paints to look like a lot of materials, including parchment. Here you can see a test swatch I made to closely match the detached drum head, which we thought might have gone with the drum. However, since there's a chance that the drum head isn't original and it's very dark and discolored, beyond what would be typical even for aged parchment, you can see all the spotty stains. We decided to go with a somewhat lighter shade seen on other drums from the same time period. Next slide, please. I cut the paper to size and toned it. I've been told that they look a lot like tortillas in this picture, but they're, they're paper. <laughs> but seriously, though, this part was a lot of fun. And I was very excited to discover a happy accident, which was that I could achieve a speckled veiny parchment like effect by placing plastic sheeting under the paper and letting the water and paint cool in its wrinkles and folds. So I didn't have to paint in all those little lines and veins, it just sort of happened automatically as part of the process, which was great. Next slide, please. And then I stretched the paper around the wood hoops, just like you would with parchment. I used two layers of paper for extra strength. And the paper was nice because it held itself in place just with friction, so I didn't have to glue it down or anything like that. And as a result, it would be easy to remove if anyone needs to do that in the future. In conservation, one of our main ethical tenets is to make our treatments be as easily reversible as possible. So this is really hitting the mark there. Next slide, please. Moving on to the ears, these can actually be purchased in a variety of colors and shapes from traditional drum makers, but I wanted to make them myself so that I could have more control over the materials used, ensuring that they would age well over time. Ears looked like originally on the cabin drum. So I Easy chain consisting of slip knots, which you can see that Dave has done here in the image on the right. This rests along the lower panel hoop, and Dave's drum is upside down, so it's along the top in the image, and is tied to the nearest vertical section of rope. I didn't do this on the Calvin drum, though, since there's no evidence that it had been that way originally. 
And it's also typical in aged drums for there not to be any of the census rope, either because it broke off over time or maybe somebody cut it off or maybe it just wasn't that way to begin with. So it seemed more appropriate to, to do it the way that I did it. Next slide. And here's Only five in the world? Just in the country. Oh, oh well, but Canada's not. Oh, in the North America. <laughs> okay. Sorry, in North America, yes. All right, now, those ears yes. that you showed us, their purpose is to maintain the tension on the ropes? Mm -hmm. Now, what's the purpose of a snare? Uh, it has to do with the sound, I believe. And the vibration. Anybody else here have a question for Laura before I let her get away? Yes, sir. So the ropes aren't under a lot of tension, are they? No. The ropes are not under a lot of tension, are they? No, no. Uh, no, that's a very good question. Uh, I don't know why they're put away, you know, not knowing, not listening. And it was quite a moment, by the way. Yeah, absolutely, you're right. Um, so our audience member was talking about a violin that had been stored completely strung and tight and tore itself apart over time. Yes, that's exactly uh, a concern that we had with the drum. So the rope is just tight enough to hold everything in place, but it's not really putting the wooden elements under any undue tension for that very reason. I felt like if I made them all myself, I could have more control over exactly how they look. It's the metal hardware, if there were rope hooks, then I would have just bought those. But like I said, we did and they could actually be quite damaging. I've seen some drum heads, if they're exposed to conditions that are extreme enough, they can actually break. Which has no risk of doing that. Anything else just now? All right, thank you very much, Laura. You're thank you. Our president, uh, Jerry Kolinkowitz, is going to talk uh, for a minute about uh, the, uh, our, our connection, I guess, with the uh, Cowden family. Jerry is uh, the only member uh, that 
of the board of the society, in my experience, and I've been a member since 1986, uh, who is actually a, a graduate of a program in history, uh, which uh, the rest of us on the board are all amateurs. Well, Jerry's an amateur too because he does other things, but, but uh, he does have uh, advanced training. And uh, he's also a musician. So uh, he would be somebody who would be uh, interested uh, in this uh, subject on uh, sort of a triple basis, being also the president of the society. So Jerry's going to talk for a minute about the Calvin family relationship. Thank you, John, and thank you, Laura. Uh, uh, as John said, I, when I'm not busy being president of the historical in the area, uh, <clears throat> as a musician, but, uh, I came into contact with uh, a guitar player in, in the local area by the name of Jason Cowden, uh, and we played together on a number of occasions. So when we were going through the uh, through our acquisition books and, and inventorying some of our holdings, the name Cowden was called out. I said, what? I know that name. Uh, and it turned out that uh, this William Cowden was part of the same family. So when I became, before I was president or vice president, they brought me onto the board here of the board of directors and I wanted to make it my pet project to restore all of these instruments that we've had here in our collection. I don't know if you can see it on the, on the screen, but behind John there is our, our pump organ, and behind that there's our melodeon. And I wanted to see what we could do about getting these things restored. Uh, but the costs were prohibitive. Uh, but the Cowden drum was at least within our means. And thanks to some matching donations from a group called Questers, uh, we were able to contact somebody to get that fixed and we found Laura and she did a fantastic job with it. So uh, I wanna talk, uh, oh, a few years back, uh, we submitted a nomination for William Cowden to be on the, in the Northeast History Hall of Fame. Well, they passed us by on that one, but uh, I'm going to read a, a few excerpts from the write-up that, uh, that was submitted. <clears throat> from the time the first William Cowden immigrated from Ireland in the 1840s, the Cowden family has played a, a prominent role in the history of generally, and in the northeast section of the city in particular. The elder, elder William Cowden, uh, and that's the father of the guy who played the drum, uh, he joined the Union Army at the outbreak of the Civil War, and his son, also named William, while only in his early teens, enlisted as a drummer boy, as was customary at the time. During one of the Virginia campaigns in 1862, the marching band of the 114th Regiment also known as the Zouaves, uh, to which the younger William Cowden belonged, after spending the night sleeping in a ditch unseen by the rest of their compatriots, missed the call to evacuate their newly won turf. The band members awoke to the bayonets of the Confederate captors, and they were taken to the infamous Libby Prison in Richmond, and their in instruments were all confiscated. So the imprisoned musicians of war were eventually repatriated in a prisoner of war exchange. The people of Frankfurt magnanimously took up a collection to replace instruments appropriated by the band's Confederate captors. This drum here is believed to be one of those replaced instruments and it's later used by the younger William Cowden at the Battle of Gettysburg is documented in our acquisition records. And just to be clear, there's no 
We have no record or proof that uh, William Cowden was with the rest of, of that unit at the time that they were taken prisoner and sent to Libby Prison. So we don't know whether he was with them now or if he joined them later. So the drum was donated to the Historical Society of Frankfurt by the Cowden family in 1963, exactly 100 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, along with the musket used by the elder William Cowden at the landmark battle. And I don't know if you could see it, but that's right there in front of the drum. Uh, the younger William Cowden later went on to join the newly reorganized Philadelphia Fire Department, and right up to the present, several of his de descendants have distinguished themselves as local firefighters. He died in 1913, 50 years after the Battle of Gettysburg, while still a resident of Frankfurt. Uh, so, any questions about any of that? Yes. Where has the drum been uh, fitted? Has it been, uh, you know, in the place? I'm not sure I understand. Oh, I mean, since, say, from 1953 until. It's been here the whole time. Well, I know where. Like, was it in the library or the attic or. Uh, downstairs in our museum. Uh, we have some similar instruments down there. Um, we can give you a tour perhaps later on, but there, that's not the only drum in our collection. We have a few other drums and related instruments. So do you think it was intact, or more or less intact, within 1963, and it just fell off, or is that pretty much what it changed? Well, our acquisition records gave the story of, of where it came from. I'm not sure if that's what you're asking me, but. We don't have a photo or anything of when, when, like when it was given. No, except for the photo that we took when Laura first took possession of it. That's, that's basically what it looked like on it. Can we run that back again? Well. <laughs> no. Not usually. Kind of what I was getting at was that, uh, you know, there was a question that Laura asked about whether the, so the, the other two drum heads that she showed were from that drum or from the other drum, and I was kind of wondering if it had been, you know, kind of, if there were multiple drums. And yeah, they're all different sizes, yeah. so I don't, I don't think it, it would have to be a special. Any other comments, questions? That picture, I, I'd like to hear a little bit more about that last picture that, that we had with the guys with the turbans. Is that the Zouavs? Yes. That is them during the war or after the war? Or what is that? As far as we know, it's during. It was taken on, in a camp, in, in one of their camps. Okay. Zouavs are a very interesting phenomenon in that war. Uh, as, you can, as you can see from those turbans in, in that picture, uh, they, they had a, an exotic idea of what war was. Uh, and there were Zouavs on both sides. And a lot of them wore these very colorful uh, uh, uniforms. That's oh yeah, this is a, here, I have here. the regiment. Yeah, I, Army Headquarters, Brandy Station, 1863 to 64. Thank you, Susan. That is the label on that uh, picture. Uh, I can't tell about the color on these, uh, but I would guess that they're rather colorful, which is the opposite of the way we dress soldiers to go into battle these days, um, they made themselves conspicuous, these zoos. Very interesting phenomenon. I would not be crazy about being in a unit like that myself. Uh, anybody have any other questions? Jared? Well, if you think of any, you can 
tax loss. Thank you. Okay, so uh, I guess we're done. Uh, well, I'm going to give a little context of the battle yet. Oh, okay. Let me get past here. Sir. Just as a reminder, what happened in 1860 to 65 was that the United States had a serious meltdown, uh, which had been coming on. Uh, we really started to break apart in the 1850s. And this war wasn't just about slavery, it was also about what we were going to be. Were we going to be, in the end, it came down to were we going to be two countries, two middle-sized countries, were we, going to, were we going to be one great big continental country with uh, some of the characteristics of an empire? And uh, the outcome, of course, was decided in that July battle at the city of Gettysburg in July of 1863 and at the same time one that, that happened on the Mississippi River at the city of Vicksburg. My great-grandfather, Thomas Buffington, was at Vicksburg that day, and he was on the losing side. He was a corporal of Georgia volunteers. So our, uh, our lad, uh, William Calvin, was uh, a child warrior with uh, Pennsylvania volunteers uh, fighting on the same day that my great-grandfather was being surrendered with the rest of his army upon the loss of, of uh, to, the, to the Union Army of, the, of, Gettys, of Vicksburg. And uh, those two battles, both at the same time, decided the future of the United States of America. So this lad and his drum very important, I think, factor. Oh, and now we should remember that Frankfurt was, at the time, an independent town, a, a, a borough of Philadelphia County, it hadn't been consolidated into the city yet. And Frankfurt has always made the claim that for a place of its size, it had the most volunteers for the Union War effort of any place in the country. So the war was decided in part by Frankfurt people on the field at Gettysburg. Now we hope you'll join us again next month on the 14th, I believe it is, of June for John Manton's talk. Try to stay well, and good night.